skirmishing and fighting right here. Matter of fact, they're mentioned in his last book, which is on the Battle of Nashville and the Retreat and the Battle of Franklin. He, he's got three books up here. One is about Island Number 10. The second one is about the Battle of Perryville. And the third one is, of course, the Battle of Nashville. And he's got a fourth one's going to be coming out. It's actually going to be a prequel. Yes, mistaken. sir. That's correct. And uh, anyway, I met Cody uh, about a year or so ago, I think, at one of the Civil War shows. That's right. Up in uh, Franklin, and then I also met him over in South Haven, and uh, he is also an accomplished fiddle player or a violinist, whatever you want to talk. I asked him one time, what's the difference in a violin and a fiddle? He may tell us that. But anyway, we're going to have a special talk tonight, and we're going to learn about the Civil War through fiddle tunes. Go so, without further ado. Thank you very much. And, 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 and so the, the, the oh, I just moved the seat. <laughs> the go-to line for that is, it's a fiddle when you're buying it, but it's a violin when you're trying to sell it. That's, <laughs> that, that is the end. There the, you go. Yeah, my name's Cody. I, um, just real quick about myself, I am uh, from Nashville by way of Detroit. I was born this way. My accent sounds a little bit like a dumpster fire in a back alley up in the <laughs> north. That's why I sound the way I do. Um, I, uh, I wrote a trilogy. It follows the second Michigan's career, the second mission Calvary, but I got heroes and villains on both sides. Uh, the trilogy follows a set of friends who go to uh, private school together up in Detroit, and this is based off uh, a true story of the second Michigan. Their, uh, their surgeon talked about this, that when the war broke out, there were a lot of kids from the South that were going to U of M and other universities up in Detroit, and when the war broke out, well, those kids had to drop out and go home to defend their homeland. So their friends from the north that they went to school with were like, they walked, this is a true story, they walked into the train station, they, well, first of all, they had a ball the night before, they had a big party, and then walked into the train station the next day and said, hey, keep your head down, and like, don't worry about me, I'll be back in six months. <laughs> well, it turned out to be something much more than that, so I like that idea. So uh, my characters are people that start together as friends, end up on opposite sides of the war, uh, and through the, the trilogy, go on their separate adventures, but at times their paths will cross. And I like the idea of um, honor amongst enemies and you know what's more important, uh, politics and geography or, uh, or friendships, family, love, and honor. So that's, that's, that's pretty much on that. Uh, and, and all the, uh, my characters are fictional, but the, all the battles, all the historical aspects and the historical um, figures like Nathan Bedford Forrest, those are all portrayed as, as we know the best we know with our modern history today. So enough with the um, enough with the commercial. So you guys are like, all right, here comes this uh, fast talking <laughs> uh, coming down here, trying to sell us his books about the Second Mission <laughs> Cavalry. Um, so I always like to, <laughs> so I always like to start off uh, with a little medley, um, just to let you guys know what my heart is. Thank you, everybody, for coming down tonight. It'd be really weird if I here by myself. <laughs>
Um, yeah, I always like to start off with uh, kind of like a medley of you know both the anthems and then and then play um, our anthem that we all share together. So hey, you know, uh, that first medley you played really brought back some memories of the, the famous Ken Burns PBS documentary on the Civil War. You know, and I uh, I. <laughs> I'm not playing every tune from there, and I'm playing some tunes that what wasn't in that uh, program. But I use that program a lot. I was like, I got the whole track list. I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna be able to play every one of these tunes. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. So I'm gonna play for you another uh, one of the um, a, a, another anthem, and this is an early one for the Confederacy. And I try because I do a lot of these shows. I do it for roundtables. I do it for sons of Confederate veterans. I do it for sons of Union veterans and book clubs. So I try to play it right down the middle as much as I can. Uh, so we're going to jump over to the Confederate side. Now, this is an early tune. A lot of you may know it's called the, uh, the Bonnie Blue Flag. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yeah. uh, and so the Bonnie Blue Flag, is, as you, a lot of you know, is a very early flag for the Confederacy. It's a big blue field with a single... Uh, white star in the center. Now the tune is actually an old Irish jig called uh, the Irish Jaunting Car. And uh, it was, um, and a jig is a dance tune. And they can tell you the difference between a jig and what we play a lot here in America, which are like reels and, and, and marches. Marches and reels are in two four. So they're like, if it's a march, it's one and two and one and two and one and two. So you can march to, if it's a reel, it's, it's the same thing but faster because you can dance your one and two and one and two and one and two. Jigs are in six eight, which sounds kind of uh, complicated, but think about this. It's still two beats, but that beat instead of one and two, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that gives it that kind of rollicking um, that sound. Now, this tune is uh, played a lot. It was played a lot in the Civil War, especially by the Confederates. Uh, there was a man named Harry McCarthy, and he was an Irish immigrant, and he came over to America, and he settled in the South and became, um, he was a champion of the Southern cause, the, of the Confederacy. So he wrote the lyrics uh, that we know as the Bonnie Blue Flag, and I don't know all the lyrics. It's something like, we are a band of brothers, native to the soil. Yeah, I bet some of you guys know this. Uh, a lot of bands play in more like a march, like 2-4, especially if you go to some of these old-timey jams. Uh, I'm gonna give it a little bit more of the, of the uh, Irish feel to it. So here we go, the Bonnie Blue Flag. <laughs> Positions, old Irish tunes for propaganda uh, purposes. The North did it too. And uh, I'm going to play for you a tune that uh, most people today know as Bonaparte Crossing the Rhine. And this is an old Irish tune. Now, if you can imagine, Bonaparte may have been an enemy of Britain and England, but he was uh, apparently Catholic. And the Irish loved anybody who was uh, killing right coats, so they were very happy about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so, they, so this is a happy tune uh, when uh, you know, Bonaparte started uh, uh, taking his armies of, um, of republicanism and, uh, and eventually of um, empire across the, the Rhine and invaded uh, Germany. Uh, the, the Yankees uh, repurposed this song and they call it Sherman's March to the Sea. So. Here is Sherman's March to the Sea or uh, Napoleon or Bonaparte crossing the Rhine. Here we go. <laughs>
right, so uh, the next student, I'll tell you this. How many people here own a pickup truck? Actually, I don't, but I, uh, okay, how many? Okay, so they always say uh, don't own a pickup truck if you don't want to help people move. And, uh, and that's why I don't own one. Uh, you can't put anything in a, in a Toyota Prius, especially a, a compact one. Um, well, if you play the fiddle or the violin, you're probably, there was a violinist here? Yeah, so you've probably been asked to play people's weddings. Oh, you play the violin, why don't you play the violin? So I'm gonna play you a tune that I play, and when, I, when people ask me to play weddings, I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm not really a classical violinist, so I'm not gonna play like the stuff that, I'll play Here Comes the Bride, I can do that. But uh, <laughs> you're not gonna get the kind of stuff, I'm gonna play more fiddle stuff, but I'm gonna play pretty stuff. And this is a tune that I play a lot uh, because it's, it's pretty, <clears throat> but I never tell them the, the title because it's a beautiful melody. It's got a very ugly name. <laughs> really? It's called Old Piss. It's <laughs> Old Piss. <laughs> and it's a, it's a very popular uh, fife and drum tune from Pennsylvania. And uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, speculation of how it came about, about that name. And what a lot of people uh, think is that there was a, um, it was used as a marching tune for, for one of the regiments. And they, uh, the men called the colonel, who was kind of an honorary guy, they called Mold Piss and Vinegar. And this was his, this is his tune and his, uh, um, for his voice. So I play it at weddings, I just don't let the bride's mother know that. <laughs> yeah, they're like, you got, they got a list? <laughs> and I just, I don't put, you know, I, I think there's another name I've, I've, I've seen associated, it's called A Few Days. And so I kind of like to think of, like you're going off to war, and you're like, yeah, we're going off to war, but hopefully in a few days we'll be all over and we'll be going home. So I maybe that's... I thought it could have been an old horse. Old horse? <laughs> yeah, old pants, you know, a horse. I don't know, think of an old horse when I play it, see if it works. All right, there we go. Gotta find my head. Your daughter's wedding. I mean, I, 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 I'd skip it if you wanted me to. Um, thank you very much. I, yeah, I think it's very pretty. Um, all right, I want to play another regimental. We're going to jump back over to the um, uh, to the uh, Confederate side. So the, the uh, and, and I tell you, I, I like this song a lot. This is the uh, Yellow Rose of Texas. Ooh, now, yeah. now I will tell you that I told you the title of it, and I'm going to start playing it, and you're going to be like. I don't quite remember it that way. Well, I play, what you probably are familiar with is the Gene Altry version that I think came out in the late 30s. And he, he kind of cleaned up the melody and, and made it nice and changed the lyrics and everything like that. Uh, it's an old minstrel tune. And um, back in the mid 19th century, uh, they used to call people that were a mixed race, black and white, they would call them yellow skinned. And because to them, those people had caramel, colored skin, so they were, they, they were called yellow people. 
And there was an old minstrel tune uh, about um, the Yellow Rose of Texas being a beautiful mixed race woman that he's going to go back to Texas so he can go see her. And um, uh, it became associated with the legend of Emily West and uh, became a theme song for the, the, the Texan War of Independence. Emily West was a real person, but she's kind of shrouded in mystery. We don't know a whole lot about her. And some of the story, a lot of the story is legend, some of it's true. We know that Emily, we think she was born probably in Boston, uh, born a free woman, and uh, lived in New York City. At some point, she took a deal, a, an indentured servitude deal, and when she went out to Texas to go work in, in a, um, uh, at a hotel out there. And during that time is when the, the, the Texas uprising happens, and she is captured by Mexican cavalry. And now there's a lot of different stories and legends. One of the legends is, is that she, she's a beautiful woman, and Santa Ana, General Santa Ana, uh, was never gonna pass up on a beautiful woman. So the, the legend is, is that she was his lover, and that uh, he lost the Battle of Jacinto because they were together. And let's just say when the battle, when the Texans uh, attacked in the morning, he got caught with his pants down. <laughs> uh, now, uh, the, other, the other legend is, uh, has anybody ever seen the, uh, the, the TV series, Texas Rising? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so the other legend is, is that she was a spy for the Texans and she was, um, she was definitely, well, according to this legend, she was also his lover, but she was feeding the Texans information, and that's why they were able, apparently Santa Ana, and he is in my fourth book, which is I'm writing right now about the Mexican War, uh, he was um, very confident in his military skills, and so apparently before the evening of the Battle of Jacinto, he didn't really bother to, uh, he figured, well, we'll just get up in the morning and go kill the Texans, well, they, <laughs> they showed up, and that was the end of that for him. Yeah. So um, anyway, uh, the other thing I'd like to say about this is that uh, this tune has a lot to do with what, right where we stand right now. Um, and, and it's in my book, Blood for Blood at Nashville. The third part of that book is the whole Nashville campaign. And it starts with Hood, uh, General Hood crossing the, Al I mean, the Tennessee River right here. And um, they had to build a, a pontoon bridge to get across. And actually what they did is they crossed over to one of the islands and then built a pontoon bridge over there. And the second Michigan uh, was the first uh, Yankee unit to get out there to try to contest them, but they only had like a couple thousand men against 40,000 Confederates. And, uh, and so the, um, uh, the Confederates were able to bring up their artillery and just kind of push you know, the Union Cavalry back and then build their, their bridges. And there's a scene, and this is in my book, and this is uh, based on real history, uh, Hood was missing a leg, missing an arm. And he, well, he had his arm, but it was no good, it was in a sling. And so he walks up onto his horse, and they have to help him up onto his horse, and then they took his, his crutch and, and tied it to the uh, back of his saddle. And then he gets up on his, uh, uh, he starts leading his army across, and it begins to rain, and behind him, there is a, a band, a brass band, playing. And as they're crossing the river, and it's like Caesar crossing the Rubicon, you know, because it is on. And, um, uh, they played Dixie and they played the Yellow Rose of Texas, but they played this version. So here we go. <laughs> Okay, we're going to get into uh, a little bit of the battles now. 
And um, one of the first battles, major battles of the war, is, as you guys all probably know, is uh, the uh, Battle of Manassas or, or Bull Run, the first one. And, um, and it's, a, it's a battle in which the Federals got their rear ends handed to them pretty harshly. <laughs> And um, <laughs> it was a quite an embarrassing defeat for them. And I think also it was the first clue that this wasn't gonna be over in three months, that we were gonna be at this for a while. And the one thing I find kind of funny about it and, uh, is that uh, Manassas was not far from Washington, D.C. And so a lot of the people in D.C. thought, you know, wouldn't it be a great idea? Uh, whenever you start something that way, it's probably not a great idea. <laughs> but wouldn't it be a great idea if we, if we loaded up our picnic baskets and took our carriages out there and found a nice, play, find a nice place up on the hilltop so we could watch the battle, kind of like as a you know, Sunday football game. And I can only imagine them sitting out there on their blankets and having their, you know, their, their little cakes and their little sandwiches and they're watching. Like, oh, listen to that. You can hear the crackle, the musketry, the boom of the, um, of the cannons and... And then all of a sudden they're like, yeah, look, hey, actually, here come some of our boys. They're, they're, they're coming this way. In fact, they're, they're running this way. And, uh, and that guy just dropped his gun. And, hey, there's some more behind them, but they're, holy cow, they're coming this way. And so uh, what happened was is that all these civilians, as the federal line broke and started running back to Washington, D.C., um, the, uh, the civilians that came out there for the, their picnic were right in the way of the retreat line. And so it was an absolute disaster of all of them clogging the road, their carriages in the way, and it started raining, and their pets' heads were falling off. And so um, this song is called Abe's Retreat, and it's, uh, it's also known as Manassas, so I'll try not to screw this one up. <laughs> retreat. We'll get back to old Dave um, coming up pretty soon here. Uh, so I'm going to play another one for you. Now did you notice that song kind of had kind of a dark smoky feel to it? Um, it's because it's not in a major key and it's not in a minor key either. It's, it's, it's actually what we call a modal key. Um, not to get too deep into uh, musical theory. And basically, it's kind of a mix between the two. It's got a major third, but a flat seventh, and I, that's probably way too much that you need to know. <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of the, uh, the old fiddle tunes and a lot of the newer bluegrass stuff likes to use that key. Uh, key. I think uh, one guy, I can't remember his name, one guy calls it uh, a mount, mountain minor. Uh, I'm gonna play no song in it, and I'm gonna do a federal one. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, story. So, in a little bit is in my second book, the Battle of uh, or um, the Perils of Perryville. And so, in the late summer of '62, um, early fall, the, um, the the Confederates realized that there was no Federal army between them and almost all of Kentucky. 
and it was it was just left wide open. The Federals had moved up to uh, uh, St. Louis, not St. Louis, uh, Louisville, uh, to lick their wounds, and the way was open, wide open for them. And so they decided that this would be a great time to go into Kentucky because Kentucky was riding the line. There was a lot of pro-Confederates, a lot of pro-Unionists. Uh, uh, Kentucky fed both armies uh, with volunteers. And so they decided that they, if, they, if they could take Kentucky, they could instill their own governor and there'd be 20,000 men ready to uh, flock to their banner. Um, and, uh, and so they marched on Kentucky, I and mean, they took the capital and put their own governor in there. They brought 20,000 rifles uh, to hand out to volunteers. And uh, meanwhile, the small garrison in Cincinnati are panicking because there is nobody between them and 40,000 screaming rebels. And so a call goes out um, throughout the state of Ohio looking for volunteers to come and defend Cincinnati. And, and 15,000 men showed up to defend the city. But these weren't soldiers, at least not yet. These were men, these were farmers. You know, Ohio is very much a rural state. And uh, the Yankee commander there kind of derided them and said, yeah, these aren't soldiers. They're a bunch of squirrel hunters. And you know how when people use like a derogatory term like, like deplorable, then, 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 then you adopt it and, and you make it a badge bond. So these men started calling themselves the Squirrel Hunters. And there's a famous painting, some of you may have seen it. Um, it's called the Squirrel Hunters and it shows this line of thousands of men, you know, just in their rural clothes, bringing their old flintlocks and their old squirrel guns and following pieces. So um, this is uh, Squirrel Hunters and it's in honor of the men who came um, to defend Cincinnati. Now, spoiler alert, uh, the, the rebels never got that far. It was a feint. Um, they ended up bumping into the, rebel, or the Union Army at Perryville, both of them looking for water during a drought. And what ensued was the bloodiest and largest battle in Kentucky um, in recorded history. Now, the Native Americans might have had something very that they don't know about. But we haven't found the archaeological evidence. But this, one, this one was pretty big. Uh, so here we go. Squirrel hunters. for you I think uh, is probably the most popular song of the war uh, up until this point we've been going back and forth playing Confederate and Yankee songs this one is something that would have been uh, popular in both camps and um, in fact it was so popular that some of the Yankee commanders forbid it to be played uh, this is home sweet home and um, uh, very interesting story and there's a couple stories that uh, um, of this happening uh, during the war the one that that I know of that we actually have men writing home first-hand accounts of it, is after the Battle of, I don't know, let's see, get my battles mixed up. It was after the Battle of Fredericksburg, and both of the armies are camped along the Rappahannock for miles. And as you guys know, uh, the Civil War wasn't like a video game where like you put a quarter in and you just blow away other soldiers, you know, every single day. You might spend a year and a half sitting around in camps before you fire a gun in anger. And, um, and so after the Battle of Fredericksburg, which was a particularly gruesome one, 
uh, the armies sat idle along the Hap uh, Rappahannock and the men got bored. And this is that famous time where, you know, the Rappahannock, there are, there are a lot of fording places, you know, where um, you know, Billy, uh, Billy Yank and Johnny Red would meet each other and trade coffee for tobacco, trade newspapers, hand off letters to send home, um, those kind of things. One of the other things that would happen is that uh, almost every regiment had a band. And, and just so you know, it wasn't so they could just rock out while they were killing other people. Uh, the bands were very important, they were for morale, but they were also like, um, uh, they used drum calls and, and bugle calls to communicate to the men on the battlefield because you could hear them. Uh, also, when you marched, you know, giving a good marching tune to set the pace, we, we do that. But they would also play and entertain themselves. And a lot of the band members would play brass instruments, but they'd bring their fiddles, um, you know, for campfire kind of stuff. Fiddles were not official instruments, but there were a ton of them there. They are very, because they're very light. And as you notice, I'm not plugged into anything. I'm not using any amplification, none of that. And I've done, cath I've done weddings in cathedrals with no mics, and I filled the whole place. Well, anyway. The fiddle um, and the banjo were the most popular, I guess. And my partner, I have a partner, and we play it together. Like, he's a banjo player. He plays old Freeland, uh, Claude Hammer stuff. And so um, uh, they would, the bands would have uh, kind of like a battle of the bands where like maybe the Rebels would be playing something and then the Yankees would try to uh, up, up play on top of them. And then eventually it turned into they would take turns, you know, they try to outdo each other and play, try to play their, their uh, patriotic songs. And one night, uh, the federal band started playing Home Sweet Home. And the Confederates, the Confederate musicians, instead of trying to out, out, play on top of them or play something different, they started playing it too. And then men started singing, men on both sides of the river. And then all, soon, all along the Rappahannock, men in gray, butternut, and, and blue are singing Home Sweet Home. And, um, uh, according to one man who wrote home, he said he had never seen anything quite like it. He said that that one moment, that one moment, it was as if um, they forgot that they were enemies. So here we go. Home sweet home. I started the story that uh, some of the federal commanders banned the song in camp because every time it got played at night while the men were drinking and sitting around the campfire, they'd have the desertion the next day. So they're like, stop playing that. And I think Lorena was another one. Um, all right, so uh, who here has seen the Ken Burns documentary? Oh, yeah. All right, so uh, uh, just like you can't own a pickup truck without having to move your friends, and you can't play the fiddle uh, without uh, playing people's weddings. Um, if you're going to play the fiddle and you're going to go to Civil War events, everybody wants you to play. What do they want you to play? A silken fiddle. Yeah, yeah, it's like stairway to heaven for fiddlers. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and now a lot of you probably know this already, but this, the tune was actually written in 1980 by Jay Unger. Um, and it was, he was at a, 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 like a he's a famous middle player and, and tuner. Yeah, I didn't know, I thought it was older than that. Well, there's more to it though. He, 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 he wrote it at a, a camp, and it was kind of like the last day of this camp, and they were all, um, you know, for their final performance. Um, but it's said that it is 
that it's inspired by an old Scottish lament, and it has kind of that, it, it's a wall, it's just in three, four, but it feels more Scottish than it does that. And also, some people say that the melody is very close to Stephen Foster's Master in the Cold, Cold Ground. Yeah. Um, so, so, I guess, even though it may not be authentic, uh, authentically a Civil War tune, uh, something like it could very well have been played at that time. So we're just going to say that it is. <laughs> and I'll tell you that that it, it did it to me twice. You, you, the first time when I didn't know the, the whole story about the letter, and they they uh, I think it's in the first or second second episode, and they play the tune and they're reading the letter of this oh, yeah. officer about, and he's telling his wife how much he loved her. And you know how much he loved the kids, all that stuff. And then the narrator comes out and just yanks the rug right out from me. And he says, two days later, yeah. he would die." Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, "Fucking ball my eyes out." <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> thankfully I played it poorly enough that nobody ever cries. <laughs> <laughs> that at the end of a show farewell because it's happy a show farewell is so sad um that tune is one of the first tunes i learned as a fiddle player and um it's a very old tune uh it was played by both sides not just of the civil war but of the american revolution as well it's an old uh an old tune that comes from the british isles and um a there's a lot of debate about what soldier's joy means some people say it's payday some people say it's prostitutes, opium. Um, I like to think of it as the end of war because as much as young men can't wait to go to war, the next thing they can't wait for is to go home. And so, you know, and so, uh, so as we're wrapping up, I've only got, uh, I'm gonna do two more tunes. Um, so I always like to think that Soldier's Joy is them coming home. So we're gonna, we're gonna do, um, before, as the war comes to its end, uh, we have one more big casualty uh, to talk about, and um, and that is uh, Abe Lincoln. The, so the song is called uh, Boot the Shot Lincoln, and you can either play it fast and happy or slow and solemn. It just depends on what side of the Mason Dixon line. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to cut it down right down the, down the middle, but this is uh, Boot the Shot Lincoln.
We'll shoot them again. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to play one last one. So the, the, the American Civil War, we still feel the scars of it today. Absolutely. And uh, it, 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 it's really tough uh, to, to work in this, this space because when you're writing tunes and you're going to events and you're, um, you're playing, I'm sorry, you're writing books, playing fiddle, because people are very, you know, they, uh, very emotional about it. Uh, you know, we, I think um, two thirds of, a, or, yeah, two thirds of a million people, soldiers die, and that's not including the millions that starved to death, lost their homes, lost everything. Um, it was a horrible thing. It was a terrible, growing pain um, for our country. Uh, I, I'm happy with the result in that we are one country today. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to be a very, I, I, I'm happy that how welcomed I am being a, a, a filthy Yankee from the gutters of Detroit. <laughs> how well, you know, it's, all those jokes you guys make is true. Like nobody from the South retires up in the North. There's a reason why. <laughs> yeah. There's a reason why we, we cover back is, um, you know, there's the one good thing that came out of it, regardless of every single combatant had his or her own, and there were some hers, had their own reasons why they picked up a rifle and went and fought, for sure. And for sure, a lot of people was because they're burning the farms and they're invading my state. But the one good thing that came out of the war, one, one of the end results, was that millions of our fellow Americans got their freedom. And even though it would take them a long time to get fully there, and some people say that we're still working on that today, um, uh, the uh, emancipation um, for millions of our fellow Amer Americans was a great thing to make this truly a land of free. So um, this song was written to commemorate that. Uh, it is called, and I'll tell you something too, it's, it's a song that, uh, it's a minstrel tune, and even though it had very good intentions, you know, things that we, we said at one time, 50 years later, all of a sudden you can't say that anymore, even though it was supposed to be polite. So the, the lyrics could be a little, uh, okay. Um, but, but it is to celebrate the emancipation and freedom for uh, uh, our black Americans. This song is called The Kingdom Come, The Year of Jubilee. And also if you watch uh, uh, Ken Burns, you'll recognize this tune. Thank you.